All right, Kenny's 3030. We're going to go over this week the axial segments or the axial skeleton. This is our thorax, um, our cervical spine, our neck, our head, and down into our pelvis. Okay, so we're going to talk through each of these segments, what they can do, and also the muscles that coordinate those segments. Um, this section gets a little tricky. Um, we have muscles that cause movements on one side compared to the other because these aren't um, left and right sides of the body or individual limbs like we've been talking about with the upper extremity. This is a single unit and some of these muscles are going to move parts of the body on the right or move them on the left. We're going to get a little tricky with each of these. Okay, with these structures, okay, we're going to talk through the vertebral column, the ribs, the skull, okay, all of those individual sections of our vertebrae, like our lumbar spine, our thoracic spine, and our cervical spine. Remember, you have seven bones, 12 bones, and five bones, and then nine bones that make up our coccyx or our sacrum and our coccyx together. Okay, this connects to our pelvis, and our pelvis is going to be an integral part in the movements that are available above the pelvis and below. Okay, so we'll talk about each of these, and we're going to talk about these individual pieces of fascia like the linea alba, the inguinal ligament, and how these connective tissues move across the body and work as origin and insertion sites for some of these lumbar, especially lumbar muscles. Okay, so there's a lot of connective tissue that pulls and moves things around because we have so many degrees of freedom or available ways to move with our axial segments. Um, things get a little tricky. Okay. When it comes to individual movements, we're going to look at lumbar, we're going to look at thoracic, we're going to look at, um, or we're going to look at cervical, thoracic, and lumbar spine. We'll also look at how the pelvis moves in relation to the lumbar spine. Okay, if we look at these in different ways, um, trunk flexion and posterior pelvic tilt are the same. Trunk extension and anterior pelvic tilt are the same. A right lateral flexion is also um, left pelvic tilt. Um, so each of these, they, they coordinate together. We'll go a little deeper into those. Okay, so we have flexion, extension, hyperextension, lateral flexion, rotation, and then these pelvic tilts. <coughs> okay, I'm going to move so that you can kind of see. Reset recording. Okay, so with these pelvic tilts, we have anterior pelvic tilt, which if you think about the pelvis as kind of like a bowl of soup or kind of like an open circle, okay, with our pubic symphysis in the front, our sacrum in the back. An anterior pelvic tilt, we tip that bowl anterior. Posterior pelvic tilt, we tip that bowl posterior. Okay, left, right, okay, right, left as we tip and then we can have rotations in each direction. Okay, kind of like we're grabbing a steering wheel. We'll get into those a little bit more when we go into the lower extremity, but just remember with those anterior, posterior, and anterior pelvic tilt is tipping the pelvis forward, posterior pelvic tilt, tipping the pelvis backwards or moving that pubic symphysis anterior, superior, or moving it inferior for an anterior pelvic tilt. We'll go into a little bit more depth of how those muscles cause those actions. If we look at the arrangement of these muscles, um, they are deep or superficial. And so they layer on top of each other, on top of our abdominal wall, okay, both anterior and posterior. Um, this gives us structural support for the lumbar spine. Okay, we need those muscles to give us stability because realistically our lumbar spine is just five bones stacked on top of each other. Um, so we use all of these large muscles that connect and create this corset and stability around our midsection. And each one is deep to another. So external oblique, and then we move to rectus abdominis, internal oblique, and transverse abdominis down those layers. Okay. The first one we'll talk about is rectus abdominis. Okay, this is everybody's favorite, the beach muscle. Okay, your six pack, your eight pack. Um, each individual fiber or set of fibers within the uh, rectus abdominis, it moves from one edge to another tendinous excription. So these are individual pieces 
for individual sections of the rectus abdominis. Okay, they all have their origin on the pubic symphysis, okay, anterior on the pelvis, and then an insertion on costae five through seven, okay, so the middle of the ribs, the xiphoid process, and each individual tendinous inscription. Okay, those are the lines in between those muscles. And then the linea alba, which moves medial to the rectus abdominis on both sides. Okay, so it runs right down the middle. Um, it's our linea alba. <clears throat> okay, so when these muscles contract, they're an anterior trunk muscle. They're going to cause anterior trunk movements. Okay, so if each of those individual fibers contract and pull their tendinous inscription towards each other, we would get trunk flexion. Okay, so think about doing sit-ups. Um, that's trunk flexion, doing crunches, trunk flexion. We also get a posterior pelvic tilt. Okay, this is moving that pelvis or moving the pubic symphysis here anterior on the pelvis, moving that superior towards the trunk. So think about things like reverse sit-ups, um, things like when you're holding a plank position, when you're doing any kind of leg raise activity and you bring your pelvis back. Okay, right now, if you try to do a little turtle butt and sink your butt underneath, you're doing a posterior pelvic tilt. You're using rectus abdominis to cause that action. Okay. These muscles can also work bilaterally or unilaterally. Okay, bilaterally, they will work together for those anterior trunk movements. Unilaterally, they'll be synergists for obliques or lateral movements. Okay, so if we contract um, the left side of our rectus abdominis, it will cause left lateral flexion, a little bit of rotation. Okay. When we look at the upper and lower fibers, upper fibers of rectus abdominis will cause more trunk flexion activities. Okay, so it's going to be more dominant in moving the thorax rather than moving the pelvis. The lower abdominals are going to move the pelvis to a greater extent than moving the thorax. Um, so if you're trying to get the lower half of your six pack, you got four and you're working the other two. Pelvic tilting activities is where you're going to target more of those muscles compared to um, doing just kind of trunk flexion activities, not paying attention to the pelvis. If you're training the abdominals, you have to pay attention to where the pelvis is, if it's moving, if it's not moving, and how it's moving. Okay, because that's the origin site for all of these trunk muscles or all of these um, anterior abdominal muscles. Okay. So let's move on to our next one. We're going to move on to external oblique. External oblique is the most superficial of these abdominal muscles. Okay. It has its origin here on the iliac crest and up the inguinal ligament okay, onto this abdominal fascia here, if you see my cursor. Okay. And then it has an insertion on the inferior eight costae, okay, so on the ribs. Okay, these muscles will have insertions on the thorax and origins on connective tissue and the pelvis because the pelvis is the most stable piece of this system. Okay, so if we think about where they would move, they're going to move insertion towards origin or move those costae right there, medially and inferiorly towards the midline of the body or cause, what would that be? Contralateral rotation or opposite side rotation. So right external oblique causes left rotation. Left external oblique causes right rotation. They're opposite side or contralateral rotators. Okay, remember that, remember that, remember that. Okay, put a little star by it opposite side rotator, okay? When they work bilaterally or work together, both of those muscles contract together. At the same time, they will be synergists for rectus abdominis and create trunk flexion, okay? So they will neutralize each other's rotation and allow only flexion, okay? When they're causing flexion, we know that lumbar flexion and Posterior pelvic tilt are the same movement. Okay, we're just looking at a different reference point. Okay, they're the same movement, so it can also cause a posterior pelvic tilt. Okay, or move on one side when if the thorax is stable, the pelvis will move. If the pelvis is stable, the thorax will move. 
okay, but they will always move towards each other. Okay? When we move a little bit deeper underneath rectus abdominis, underneath external oblique, we have internal oblique. Internal oblique is a same side rotator. So we'll just key it off first, it's the same side rotator. Okay, it has an origin on the iliac crest, the inguinal ligament and the lumbar fascia, so kind of posterior um, on that body, um, posterior on that pelvis, okay, and also an insertion on costa 8 through 10 in the linea alba. Okay, so it moves from here, has its insertion on the midline and on the thorax, and then its origin a little bit more posterior on the pelvis and the lumbar fascia. Okay, this is going to cause the midline to move posterior towards the same side pelvis, creating a same side rotation. So external oblique and contralateral internal oblique will cause a rotation towards the internal oblique. Okay, um, so say this is left external oblique, right internal oblique, they will work together to create right rotation. Okay, so um, contralateral, internal, and external oblique will always work together to create this kind of diagonal sling across the midsection. They're across from opposite side um, thorax to opposite side posterior pelvis to create this line of pull to create rotation or allow you to move across, okay, or allow you to move diagonally across your body and bring the thorax towards the contralateral iliac crest. <clears throat> so internal oblique, same side rotator, ipsilateral rotator, star that, know that, um, check that off. Same side rotation. Okay. <clears throat> when these two work bilaterally, okay, when the internal oblique works bilaterally, it does the same as external oblique or they become synergists with rectus abdominis to create trunk flexion. Okay, so they'll work together for flexion as long as right and left internal oblique are contracting together. Okay, contracting together. All right, when we move even deeper, maybe we move to the next level, the most deep of our abdominal muscles is transverse abdominis. Transverse abdominis is a little bit special. It's a little bit different than the other abdominal muscles. It has its origin on the lumbar fascia, the ilium, and the inferior six costae, so a you know, posterior origin and an insertion on the linea alba. Okay, so we're moving across, this muscle's moving across our body here. Our transverse abdominus, a tr transverse, a think diagonal to our abdominals, a, around the transverse plane, it's not going to cause any kind of rotation. It's not gonna cause any real kind of movement. What it's really going to cause is compression of the abdominal wall, okay? So creates compression. Yeah, these are kind of deep muscles that create a cinching effect or create a corset effect around a, our abdomen, okay? So it creates intra-abdominal pressure. So if you take a deep breath and go and contract your abdominals, like someone's gonna come and punch you, and you feel how everything cinches up, it feels like it compresses your midsection, all of those organs, that's creating intra-abdominal pressure. When you contract transverse abdominis, it creates pressure in that abdominal cavity. Okay, think about grabbing a water bottle and squeezing it really tight. That's what's happening in your midsection. This creates stability for the lumbar spine. So this is an incredibly important muscle when it comes to lumbar stability. Okay, so it creates a stable, it's compressed, especially if we take a deep breath in or a small breath in. Um, taking that breath and then closing our epiglottis or performing the Valsalva maneuver where we and go very tightly and then create more pressure in our thoracic cavity and our lumbar cavity. Okay, that creates pressure, creates stability. Um, those muscles, those abdominal muscles are there for stability. Um, they're not there to move too much, but especially transverse abdominus, it's there to create intra-abdominal pressure or squeeze everything inside the abdomen to create stability for the lumbar spine. 
So we've moved down each one through. I want you to pause the video right now without going back through your notes and try based on viewing where they are in the images and thinking back to what you remember, try to list out origins, insertions, and actions or movements for each of those abdominal muscles we just covered for rectus abdominis, external oblique, remember opposite side, internal oblique, remember same side, and transverse abdominis. So those four major anterior abdominal muscles go through each one, pause the video right now, see what you can remember without going back, and then go back and finish through your notes. All right, ready, go. All right, now that you're back, hey, okay, now that you're back, I know you paused it. Hey, if you didn't just pause it, pause it. Okay, let's move posterior on the abdomen. Okay, posterior on the abdomen, the first one we'll go through is quadratus lumborum. Um, quadratus lumborum is kind of like our posterior oblique. Okay, it sits on the um, lateral aspect of our lumbar spine and our sacrum and our lower ribs, and it allows some of this lateral movement. They have their origin on the lumbar vertebrae. Okay, so if we look here, lumbar vertebrae, and on the iliac crest. Okay, so its origin is here, posterior on the lumbar spine and on the um, iliac crest, and then an insertion on the more superior lumbar vertebrae and the 12th costa or the 12th rib. Okay, what do you think would happen if we contract this muscle? If we think through, okay, if it's pulling those lumbar vertebrae towards the iliac crest, it's going to cause same side lateral flexion. If it contracts and pulls those lower ribs towards um, our iliac crest, it's going to cause extension of the lumbar spine. Okay, so our actions, if they work bilaterally, extension, unilaterally, lateral flexion. Okay. But what's really important about quadratus lumborum is that it is a stabilizer, so it's not there to make you shift to the side. It's really there to resist opposite side lateral flexion, which occurs when we walk. Okay. Think about when you walk. If you walk and you kind of move side to side with your trunk, and you probably have back pain too. Um, your quadratus lumborum is probably not working very well. Um, side planks, do some side planks. Okay, quadratus lumborum helps us resist moving to the side or shifting our weight side to side as we take steps. So pause the video right now, and I want you to stand on one leg and see what happens to your upper body. Okay, you can do it looking in the mirror. Okay, if you stand on one leg and everything starts shifting to the side, you have a problem. Okay, you should probably start doing a few more side planks. Um, and really engage your quadratus lumborum and stop it from letting you move, okay? Make it, make it work, make it keep you stable and not move your upper extremity while your lower extremities are moving. Okay, now continuing with the posterior aspect of our vertebral column or our axial segments, we talked through quadratus lumborum or QL, now it stops us from moving laterally, especially at the lumbar spine. There's also quite a few more muscles. We're not gonna go through each one, we're just going to put them together and create um, what we call a muscle group or erector spinae as our large posterior vertebral column muscle group. Okay, these are our vertebral extensors and we call them erector spinae because they help, help keep the spine erect. You can go through each one if you take further anatomy classes, maybe you go into a specialty program, you'll probably go through each one more in depth than its individual actions, but together they work to keep us in a extension position, okay, or maintain anatomical position. If you relax erector spinae, you fall into trunk flexion. So their job is to resist flexion or cause extension. Um, when we have weak erector muscles, we often see poor posture at the thoracic spine with these thoracic muscles. And then if we have poor control at the lower erector spine or lower lumbar spine, we see problems with the lumbar spine and pelvic movements. Okay, so each of these individually has their own origin insertion, but we're gonna call them the ilium is our major, ilium sacrum is our major origin point. 
along with the individual vertebrae that they um, are associated with. And then their insertion is on the vertebrae that they move and all the way up through the base of the skull. Okay, so just think of these as um, moving up the vertebral column um, and having an origin on the pelvis and an insertion on the vertebrae that they move, okay, individual vertebrae that they move. Okay, their actions are to work together to create extension. Okay, we just talked about extension where everybody sit up nice and straight, feel your lower back, feel your upper back. You should feel those erector spinae moving down your lumbar spine, and then we can feel some up in our cervical spine. Okay, these keep us nice and in very optimal posture. If you have weak erector spinae, you probably lose posture very easily. Um, doing things like trunk exercises where you have to resist flexion or maintain extension are great exercise. Also picking things up the ground off the ground correctly, engage your erector spinae, solidify your lumbar spine using those anterior muscles, posterior muscles to keep you nice and stable. If they work unilaterally, they also cause some secondary movements like same side rotation. So they will work as synergists with internal oblique and contralateral external oblique to cause same side rotation. So right erector spinae, right internal oblique, and left external oblique will all work together to rotate the trunk to the right. Okay, or opposite, left erector spinae, left internal oblique, right external oblique will cause left rotation. Okay, because those same side rotators will work with the opposite side rotator to cause that axial rotation. Okay. Now we're going to transition into some more different muscles. Um, we're going to transition into some breathing muscles now. Um, our diaphragm is our major or should be our major breathing muscle. Um, it sits on the inner edge of those costals and then it has an insertion on our central tendon. These, this muscle is there to contract and open up space in the thoracic cavity. So how it contracts is by moving the central tendon inferior. Okay, so contracts to inhale, relaxes to exhale. So it pulls that central tendon to be even with the lower ribs to create space. It creates a vacuuming effect within the lungs so that you can take a breath in and then when it relaxes, it will compress the lungs so that you can Breathe out. Okay. This is where we should be breathing. So everybody take a deep breath. If you breathe through your belly, good. Okay. If you took a deep breath and went, okay, that means you're breathing through your costals and your ribs, okay, your costals and also through your shoulder blade um, or our shoulders. Breathing up here, not the optimal place to breathe. Okay, everybody really pause nice for a second and take a deep breath and try to push your diaphragm down into the floor. Ready? Feel that difference? Feel that? Everybody really deep and go. Breathe in, push your diaphragm to the floor, and then relax and feel it come back up into your midsection. Okay, That's where we should be breathing. These belly breaths or deep breaths um, are from our diaphragm. We should be breathing normally through our diaphragm. Okay, we shouldn't be breathing um, all day through our ribs and everything's moving <laughs> through our chest. Um, causes some changes with the nervous system and diaphragmatic breathing allows us to go into a parasympathetic state or allows us to relax much more efficiently than intercostal breathing. Intercostal breathing um, is the um, contraction and relaxation of the intercostal muscles to create space within the thoracic cavity. Okay, so they have an origin on the costae above and an insertion on the costae below. And as they contract at an angle, they can either separate or elevate or contract and pull the costae together. External obliques cause elevation. So the external obliques will contract and pull each of those costae up to create more um, space within the thoracic cavity, which 
lowers the pressure and allows you to breathe on in. We'll often breathe mostly using our external intercostals when we're exercising or breathing heavily and you feel your chest move as you breathe fast, you're probably using intercostal breathing. The internal intercostals cause depression or exhalation, so they're each angled slightly differently so that they can either compress or expand the thoracic cavity and allow us to breathe. Um, our scalenes, sternal quadrimaster, and some of the other costal muscles that we'll talk about can have some influence on creating more opening or less pressure within the thoracic cavity so that we can breathe in. Um, but these intercostal muscles, external elevation, internal depression, or external inhale, internal exhale. Okay? Um, remember those through when they have their origins on the costae above and insertion on the costae below. Um, this will allow us to breathe faster and create pressure and change pressure quicker, um, but it also is linked with more sympathetic nervous system activity. Think back to our last section, um, more towards that fight or flight rather than parasympathetic, which comes more with diaphragmatic breathing or more rest and digest. By manipulating how someone breathes and creating more slow diaphragmatic breathing, you can cause more relaxation and more suppression of that nervous system activity. All right, now we'll move a little bit more superior. We'll look at what's happening at the cervical spine. Splenius cervicis and splenius capitis, we'll call this our splenius group, um, are cervical extensors. Okay, these have the origin on C7 and T5, and then they have their insertion on the occipital protuberance and on C1 through C4. These muscles will cause same side extension and same side rotation. Okay, so together they can work together for extension and they will also work unilaterally for same side rotation. So right splenius will cause right cervical rotation. Okay, when we move anterior from our cervical spine, we have sternocleidomastoid. Okay, anatomy is great, it tells you exactly where it is. It has an origin on the sternum and the clavicle. Insertion on the mastoid process sternocleidomastoid, right? It, it puts it all together there for us. If we contract that muscle, we can get some cervical flexion. And we can have also opposite side rotation. So sternocleidomastoid is an opposite side rotator. So bringing that mastoid process posterior towards our sternum and our clavicle anterior, if we contract that muscle, it's going to contract and it's going to cause opposite side rotation. So my right sternocleidomastoid will cause left rotation. Okay. It can also cause unilateral lateral flexion and bilateral flexion. Okay. If we are in a position here, if we're in a more extended position, it can continue to cause cervical hyperextension. So it's a pretty diverse muscle. It can cause a lot of activities depending on the position of our head. If we're in a more head forward posture, sternocleidomastoid is going to cause more flexion at our cervical spine. Okay, if we're in a more extended position, it's going to continue to cause extension because it's going to bring that mastoid process closer to the sternum and the clavicle anteriorly. Um, so we'll call it our cervical flexor for now and our cervical opposite side rotator. Okay, so remember right sternocleidomastoid, left rotation. All right, those, that's going through each of our individual axial skeleton muscles. Um, we'll go a little bit deeper in our group review that I'm going to hold this week. I'll post it up on Blackboard on when we're having our group review. It's not mandatory, but it is highly recommended to um, virtually attend. Um, I'll also post up um, kind of an edited version of it. Um, but go through your lab. Um, I recommend now that you've watched this video that you go through your lab immediately and go through that lab and try to answer as many questions as you can with your notes, without your notes. Um, answer them as much as you can there. Then go through those individual analyses with the lab. Remember our opposite and our same side rotators. Pay attention to those. Okay, those are key. Remember, external oblique, opposite side, sternocleidomastoid, opposite side rotators. 
So star them, make sure they're special in your brain um, of what they do. Um, go through those individual movements, origins, insertions. I recommend once you're done with your lab, go back through this video and watch it over again. Okay. You can use this second viewing of the video to re-engage that information and to allow you to check your answers through your lab. Okay, I want you to check back through those answers, make sure that you have the correct muscles for the correct movements, make sure you have the correct origins, correct insertions, and correct movement analyses. Okay, take your time, go back through, but I do recommend lab now, now that it's fresh in your brain, and then rewatch this video while you check through your lab before our group review meeting. All right, thank you very much. Um, I hope you enjoy it. I hope you learned something. Um, keep it up, keep it up. Email me if you need any help. Um, I'm happy to help you right away. All right, thank you. Bye.